Energy policy is concerned with how much energy is needed and used, and with the regulation of energy producers. This becomes important during a crisis. The U.S. has always had enormous energy resources. However, the American economy depends almost entirely on fossil fuels, such as oil, coal, and natural gas, most of which are imported. Because of the effects of producing and consuming energy, energy policy is deeply entangled with environmental policy. A series of laws passed over the last 20 years has forced cities to reduce smog and to require cleaner burning gasoline. Congress has also mandated that 10% of fuels sold in the years to come include ethanol as an ingredient. As the cost of energy rises, however, the debate intensifies over domestic power production, such as offshore drilling and electric power generated by coal-fired plants. Nuclear power has been an unpopular solution. Nuclear power plants are very efficient and emit low levels of greenhouse gases. However, accidents that occurred more than 20 years ago have almost destroyed any support for nuclear power in the U.S. Not only do people fear the possibility of an accident at such a plant, but nuclear plants also provide a superb target for terrorist attacks. Finally, nuclear plants produce spent fuel that must be stored until it is safe. A number of alternative sources of energy can be used to reduce the nation's dependence on fossil fuels. Wind farms generate energy for cities, and research continues on harnessing the power of ocean waves and geothermal energy. However, the technology does not yet exist to use any of these sources to produce the quantity of energy needed to replace coal plants or other current energy sources. Rising gas prices have spurred a much greater demand for hybrid and other more fuel-efficient cars, encouraging people to ride motor scooters for city commutes and increasing the use of mass transit. Poverty and welfare relate to income transfers, and transfers of income relate to individuals in the economy. The low-income population is considered to be in poverty because of a government-devised system beginning in 1963, which based poverty on family income in comparison to the cost of a nutritious food plan. All families whose income level was not at least three times larger than the food plan were classified as below the poverty line. Since 1969, the government has revised the formula based on changes in the consumer price index. The government makes transfer payments to them in the form of programs like food stamps and housing vouchers. The 2009 budget allocated about one-fourth of all federal expenditures to programs that supported persons of limited income. More than one-fourth of this amount was for Medicaid. The Welfare Reform Act of 1996 created temporary assistance to needy families, also known as TANF. TANF is a state-administered block grant program. The states, not the national government, now bear the burden of any increased welfare spending. The Welfare Reform Act of 1996 had several key components. A key provision called for devolution of the welfare system. Most welfare recipients are now limited to two years of assistance at one time, with a lifetime limit of five years. The Act sought to reduce the number of people receiving benefits. In fact, the number has been cut about in half. Basic welfare is often criticized on several grounds. Some believe it reduces the incentive to find work. Others say it is anti-marriage because it makes it easier for unmarried mothers to get by. Supplemental security income was established as part of Social Security in 1974 to provide a minimum income for the aged, the blind, and the disabled. Food stamps were designed to help provide adequate nutrition for low-income families. The program began as a two-fold mission to help farmers sell surplus products and to eliminate malnutrition. The Earned Income Tax Credit helps lower-income workers by providing a rebate on Social Security taxes. Although each of these policies attempts to benefit the poor, there are many homeless individuals and families in America. Homelessness has always been a problem and continues to be an important one. Estimates are that on any given night, there are anywhere from 230,000 to 750,000 people who are homeless. The fastest growing subgroup of the homeless are families. Immigration is another controversial and salient issue. Immigration has shaped American society from the very beginning. 
However, one of the questions facing the country today is the effect of immigration on the present and future society. Will immigration have a positive or negative impact on the U.S.? Immigration rates are now higher since their peak in the early 20th century. About a million people immigrate to this country each year. Immigrants expand the workforce and drive wages lower. And many illegal immigrants use services such as emergency rooms and public education, which drive up costs. In 2006, the controversy over illegal immigration reached a boiling point, as some argued that jobs were being lost, wages were being depressed, and services were stretched to the breaking point. In response, hundreds of thousands took to the streets, protesting in favor of immigrants and their rights. Congress split over the issue, with some members favoring amnesty for illegal immigrants, some favoring a plan for the gradual awarding of citizenship, and others wanting to send illegal immigrants back to their home countries. Congress authorized the construction of a 700-mile fence between the U.S. and Mexico. There would be a physical fence in some areas and a virtual fence in other areas, using cameras and surveillance technologies. Some states and cities have enacted laws making it illegal for undocumented residents to access public services or to get driver's licenses. Finally, we consider crime. In 2006, overall crime rates in the U.S. dropped below those in many other countries, such as Britain. Nonetheless, virtually all polls taken in the U.S. in the last 10 years have shown that crime remains a major concern. Crime has always been considered a problem in American society. After rising for many years, violent crime rates have come down over the last 10 years. One explanation might be the large number of perpetrators who have been sent to prison. Increased spending on law enforcement has also been suggested as a reason. One study even claimed that legalized abortion has had a major effect in reducing the population likely to commit crimes. Juvenile crime rates are dropping as well. Curfews and boot camps are two solutions that have been advanced. Increasingly, young offenders are being tried as adults, especially for violent offenses. School shootings occur not only in secondary schools, but also in elementary schools and on college campuses. The perception of school shootings as a growing form of violence has been reinforced by the media, even when homicide rates in schools declined from 1993 to 2002. However, students continue to face less risk of serious violent crimes while at school than outside of school. Stiff sentences are now national policy. By 2008, the number of persons held in jail or prison exceeded 2.3 million. Why has the prison population grown so much when the crime rate has been declining in the last decade? Many states and localities have increased the list of crimes for which a criminal may receive a mandatory sentence. Also, many individuals who are in prison were convicted of drug offenses, which carry automatic sentences for a specified length of time. We refer to the number of persons held in jail or prison for every 100,000 persons in a particular population group, the incarceration rate. Today, the rate for U.S. men is 1,309 and for U.S. women, 113. Among the most frequently incarcerated demographic group are non-Hispanic black men aged 25 to 29. Their rate is a stratospheric 11,955. The U.S. has more people in jail or prison than any other country in the world, and the U.S. has the highest reported incarceration rate of any country on Earth, which is not surprising since it also has one of the world's largest total populations. Imprisonment keeps violent felons from committing additional crimes. The majority of all persons arrested each year are arrested for drug offenses. 20 to 40 million people may violate the drug laws each year so the supply of potential prisoners seems virtually limitless. One of the major causes of crime in the U.S. is the use and sale of illegal drugs. Illegal drug sales can result in violence because of turf wars between rival drug gangs. Dealers operate outside the justice system and therefore resort to violence to settle disputes. And drug users may resort to crime to finance their drugs. State and local governments have been attempting new remedies to curtail the drug problem. One strategy includes sentencing drug offenders to rehabilitation rather than prison. Probably the most devastating type of crime is terrorism because of its potential to inflict violence on thousands of victims. 
After the attacks of September 11th, the federal government enacted many policies in an effort to combat terrorism. Some policies enjoyed widespread public support. Others did not. What seems clear, however, is that counterterrorism strategies will necessarily be a part of federal government policy for years to come. One, what makes policymaking a process? Two, discuss the role of Medicare and Medicaid. Three, what impact do income transfers have on our society? Four, what are the consequences of immigration on the United States? Five, discuss the effects of incarceration. Six, how is energy and environmental policy connected?